Hey there, it's Bill Harwood over at the Kennedy Space Center. Chris, how you doing? Bill, Bill, good morning. Great to talk to you. Ah, it's great to talk to you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's weird. I was talking to somebody the other night. I, I usually ask questions that are totally focused on the mission, but, you know, every conversation these days starts with coronavirus. So, first of all, how are you doing and how's your family doing? I appreciate the the question. Yeah, we're we're doing fine. We're just kind of navigating through the last week with all the uncertainty, as is the whole world is, uh, as it pertains to us uh, as a family. We're just trying to figure out who can come to launch. Of course, that's that's uh, we can talk more about that. But um, a, as you know, it's uncertainty that's tough for people, regardless of the situation, whether it's uh, uncertainty on a on a mission. Um, mission parameters or uncertainty with your life, and and that's what's what's hard. Once you know what you're dealing with, you can move out and make a plan. But until then, it's challenging. Yeah, no kidding. How is it? How is that affecting you in Russia? I mean, are you? I know you guys follow pretty strict protocols. You know, when you're when you're this close to launch. But is there anything different going on uh, just because of the virus? Well, interestingly enough, if you'd asked me. Eight months ago, I could have told you, hey, this week, these two weeks, I will be in quarantine. But it would have been for a different reason I would have answered you that question that, that way. And now I'm still in quarantine, but so is everybody else around us. And uh, so in terms of like how it immediately affects me, kind of the same. Like I, I'm limited in where I can go. My contact with, with people is, is the same as what the, what the CDC is putting out for the whole world. Um, the probably biggest impact is this past week, had it been a normal quarantine, I probably could have gone out to some restaurants and left the, the immediate parameters of the, the Star City area uh, and just been smart about where we went, but not this time. We've been we're sort of isolated to our, our cottages and, uh, and just the essential place to go to get food. Yeah, I would imagine the very last thing anyone would want would be to bring a flu virus up to the space station. Um, how about the Russian people? I mean, are, do you get the sense that the Russians are as, as concerned about this as, as folks in America seem to be now? Oh, absolutely. What, I was in mo downtown Moscow about uh, two weeks ago, right at the very kind of onset, right when I arrived, and it was the, the beginning of the tidal wave, so to speak. And and there was some concern. There were medical-looking folks in the airport. Uh, they weren't actively testing our, our temperatures or anything. This was the first of March, I think. So it's been it's been a few days since then. Now, I, from what I, I haven't been out in town, but I hear mo the streets in Moscow are, are quiet and empty, similar to what you see on the news or uh, the rest of the world. Um, here in Star City, it's kind of like this little oasis in the woods. Life is fairly, I don't want to say normal, but people are going around. You can go to the local local grocery store, getting your hair cut. The, the, the training is still happening for the cosmonauts on the territory. But that's in our little enclave of Star City. Outside the gates, I think it's much more uh, restrictive in the, the larger metropolitan area. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is. Um, but I guess the bottom line is you're, you're pretty confident that you have not been exposed um, at this point, uh, this close to launch, and as you said, since you've already been in quarantine. Yeah, absolutely. My wife and I were on the same flight over on March 1st, and other than uh, some media folks and the people that work here in the office, I really haven't uh, been around anybody else. So, so it would be really, really strange if, if I did contract something. You know, of course, anything can happen between now and April 9th, but we're being really super vigilant so that I can remain healthy to get to the station. And last question on this topic. You mentioned your, your family and uncertainty about whether they can come to launch. Are there any restrictions at Baikonur on, on travel? I mean, if they want to come, can they, or, or, or do you even know that yet? We do know that answer, and I will have no launch guests uh, at, at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And the, as I understand all the details, again, the, the specifics have been changing rapidly, but when the borders closed, um, the Russian borders to non-Russian passport holders, that put a challenge for us because now the launch guests who go into and out of Moscow to get to Baikonur couldn't get back through Moscow. So that closed the gates for us, and uh, that was the final straw that we pulled the plug on launch support for, 
for my uh, guests. We get, as U.S. crew members on a Soyuz rocket, we get 15 uh, guests to come, including our spouse and children and that sort of thing. And so uh, none of those folks will come. Okay, so, so not just guests, but your family can't come either. Correct, and they're very limited, op op very limited in operational support down there uh, it, on the Russian side as well as the NASA side. So it'll be really. Have you, Bill? Have you ever been to to a, a Soyuz launch? You know, I have not. I've watched a million of them on television, but I've never been there. Yeah, what's super cool normally is you come walking out of the hotel where we stay for the whole two weeks that we're down there, and there's music playing, and there's crowds of people lining the the walkway as we proceed from the, the hotel to the buses. And it's very, very motivating. It's super exciting. Uh, a little bit analogous to the old the KSC days when you come out of the ONC building and get on the bus, except the walk is much longer and more people. Um, but it'll be completely quiet. There won't be anybody there. We'll just kind of walk out. Uh, maybe we'll still play the music and fire the three of us up ourselves, but who knows? Wow, it'll be like a presidential debate without an audience, which is what we've been watching lately. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. it, anyway, let me let me switch to the flight itself. I mean, one of the interesting aspects of this, of course, you were assigned to the flight late, um, obviously because of commercial crew delays and need to have a USOS crew, you know, US crew member on board. And then just a few weeks ago, your Russian crewmates uh, were replaced. How well do you know your new commander, Ivan Ishin, and, and the flight engineer at this point? What's your impression of those guys? Well, I've known Anatoly Venetian for quite a few years. He's been a cosmonaut, I think, the same length of time. I've been an astronaut, so you know, 15 years or so. And, and uh, I've been in, in and out of Star Trek with him and been to dinner at his house years ago. And he's been to dinner at my house even before we were assigned as crew members. So I know him pretty well. I uh, never really worked with him, but super professional guy and, and on top of things with... Um, very, very well. Yvonne uh, Wagner, I've known for less time. Uh, again, a great guy. He's been to dinner at my house last year, too. Um, so, but, but inside the cockpit, this past week or week and a half uh, has been the first time where we've been sitting together, look, pushing buttons, flipping through pages together, and, and supporting each other. And that's been, it's been pretty seamless so far. So... You know, if all goes well, you got Doug Hurley and Bob Binkin are going to show up later this spring on Crew Dragon. Then Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, I guess, arrive later in the summer, if all goes well. Um, two last questions here. How important is it for NASA and SpaceX and Boeing to get those, those spacecraft flying? Um, well, I mean, what's your sense of that? Well, I've been talking with, I've talked to Hopkins a few times right before I left. I uh, My schedule didn't really coincide with Doug and Bob's that much, so I haven't seen them in a while, but um, Mike Hopkins was telling me they feel pretty confident uh, for this, this summertime activity. And, and again, chatting with Pat Forrester, the same thing. The energy, the momentum, the excitement is really kind of building uh, for summertime, realistic summertime arrivals. And as you know, Bill, we chatted before when I was chief astronaut, and that was several years ago, and we were talking about this same flight. I think we all had guarded enthusiasm back then. Now it's real. Well, the next Soyuz uh, gets there in mid-October, which would nominally be your ride home, I guess. I know NASA's negotiating for a seat on that spacecraft. I'm not sure that's been finalized. Is there any realistic scenario where you would stay up for an extended mission? I'm um, just wondering what sort of contingencies are being considered, given you know there have been problems with commercial crew getting to this point. Well, NASA's pretty good about thinking through contingencies. I, I think that it, anything's on the table, and certainly this uh, coronavirus ep pandemic uh, makes us realize that even if uh, somebody, somebody told me a good quote the other day, uh, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And, and so, so I think that um, certainly there's plan B, C, D, discussions with me coming home an alternate route, but I haven't been privy to any of those discussions. Well, hey, listen, thanks a lot. They tell me I'm out of time. I hope you have a great flight, and I look forward to talking to you in orbit. Thanks, Bill. Take care and stay safe.